I was never really good at basketball, or soccer, or football. And I had some other sports that I, I might have been better in, but those I could never master. And there's a number of others that I couldn't do. Now imagine if, because I couldn't play this sport, I couldn't make a basket, or I couldn't make a, a field goal, or a touchdown, or, or what have you. What if we changed the rules? What if for basketball, if I just get close to the rim, then that's two points? Or even if I come from the three-point line and I shoot and it gets close to the rim, that's three points. What if for soccer, if I get close to the goal, then that's a goal for me? Or in football, if I get close to the field goal line or, or what have you, or if I'm kicking and I get it close enough, then that would be, you know, scorable. I doubt anyone would play a game against me. Because it's not fair. It's not about the game. It becomes about me and how I feel about it and about my feelings. And this attitude would never fly in sports. It would never fly in, you know, many other things. And yet when we talk about the ways of the world and our faith, it's very easy to say, I can never be the person God wants me to be, so I'm going to be good enough. Or I'll do just enough. Because it's not really about God anyway, it's about me. And that attitude is called secular humanism. It puts us at the center of the universe. And that God is here for our sake, not us here for the sake of God. And so once we get this mindset of this secular humanism, then everything is okay. And you know as well as I do, we can shop around for a church that suits our lifestyle. We can find a church that is going to welcome us despite what we might or might not be doing. And where is the sacrifice there? So we talk about sacrifice in the church. Where are we really sacrificing? And if our attitude is one of secular humanism, we will not sacrifice. Because we will adapt an ideology to our lifestyle instead of adapting our lifestyle to an ideology. I know that sometimes on a college campus it can be very difficult to be Catholic, let alone Christian. And that's not just on a college campus, that's on campuses across the country, even some Catholic college campuses, even some cities, wherever you are, it's difficult to be a Catholic. Christian because we are countercultural and we do not change with the times. The Catholic Church has remained virtually unchanged morally and dogmatically, whereas others have changed with the times to catch up. That they have syncretized their ways with the ways of the world. I know that some students have mentioned how some of their professors might speak out against Catholicism just blatant anti-Catholicism. And they do have a mechanism in the university that if you feel like you're being, you know, kind of discriminated against, you can address that. But I actually think that's a good thing. In reflecting on it. Because I think, why would someone go to all the trouble to criticize a particular faith tradition unless within, somewhere deep inside, they were not afraid of? to a certain extent, if they were not threatened by it. That perhaps someone who is critical of you for being Catholic is waiting for you to give them a reason why. Perhaps the one that is critical of you being Catholic is afraid that you might actually believe what you say you believe. And if that is true, what does that mean for I have a student that might be half my age and they really believe in this. They have this faith. And that is going to require me to look at my life in the mirror and say, what am I missing? Or what has happened? Because in the same vein, they are not critical. And I begin to think about this. You know, we are in the, the generation of phobias. Phobia is an irrational fear of something. 
And so psychology talks about phobia in one way, but politically, phobia has come to mean almost a hatred of the particular thing. And I am coming to believe in Christophobia, an irrational fear of Christianity. It happened back in the Roman Empire. That's why they executed him. It was easy to do that. But it goes beyond that, that there is this mistrust and inherent dislike for the Catholic Church, if not the Christian Church. And I can understand that to a certain extent, you know, with the, the priest scandal. I mean, if, if anything's going to give you a reason to leave the church, that would give me a reason to leave the church. But why? Where am I going to go? Maybe I can say, well, this has happened in the Catholic Church, so I'm going to, I'm going to join a Protestant church. Or I'm going to become Buddhist, or I'm going to become Jewish, or Muslim, or Hindu, or whatever else. And if that thought ever crossed your mind, or if anyone ever criticizes you and says that the Catholics did this, Google their religion, or whatever religion that you think, and put pedophilia with it, and watch the articles form. Piles and piles. Because I've done it. I've seen it. And where is it? We haven't heard anything about it. But it's there. So there is this inherent double, you know, standard, so to speak. I know both in the fall, we had the vigil um, for the massacre that happened out in Pittsburgh at the synagogue. We had a vigil just weeks ago for the massacre that happened in New Zealand. I wonder if you're aware of the two bombings that happened in the Philippines in January at two Catholic churches killing over 20 people and injuring countless more. That over the last month in Nigeria there have been massacre of hundreds of Christians by Boko Haram claiming this is, this is for Allah. But we haven't heard of that. Where is the Allah? And where are the vigils? If we did vigils every time the Christian church was massacred, we'd never leave the church. So there is some kind of double standard here. And again, I'm glad of that. Because Fulton Sheen would say, search for the religion that is most persecuted by the spirit of the world, and you will find the religion that is divine. And yet we don't want the struggle sometimes. Sometimes it's just easier to join another faith tradition where they welcome everybody, no questions asked, or what have you. Maybe it's just easier to leave the church, leave religion altogether. That's what this kid did, this prodigal son. <clears throat> We've heard this story many times, and I always find it fascinating, first of all, that this kid goes up to his dad, and he wants to collect his inheritance. His dad isn't dead yet! Can you imagine going to your father and saying, give me my inheritance? And they're not dead. I'd have been backhanded easily. Besides that fact, this is the younger son. He doesn't get an inheritance. He doesn't get anything. The older son inherits everything. And then it's up to him to distribute. So not only is he demanding something of his father, because he's entitled to it. But he's demanding something he has no right to at all before his father's even dead. And then he goes off. And I, I believe that's the beautiful part of this story because the son who's obviously living an oppressed life, and his dad's rich, he has servants and everything, but he's being oppressed, decides that he knows better. And he goes out on his own. It's only when he realizes that he is longing to eat what pigs eat that he decides maybe what I had wasn't so bad. And he turns back to his father. There are many reasons that we can find for an easier life of faith. The question to ask, is it real? Is it real? We can find any ideology that we can adapt to our lifestyle. 
But is that real? You see, the thing about secular humanism is there is no future. Perhaps that's why people are so angry at the faith sometimes. Because they want to live the way they choose to live, but there's no future in them. Because people will not compose poetry and hymns to a god of secular humanism. They will not build great cathedrals and offer their lives in service to secular humanism, and they will not suffer and die for a god they cannot save. They will not. There is no future in secular humanism. But the church, the true church, the one that will endure forever. And so when we talk in these days about all the phobias and political correctness and everything else, perhaps there isn't something called Christophobia. But I wonder if those Nigerians would as they still, even today, are being massacred for being a follower of Christ. Make no mistake, the martyrs of the church that we talk about were not people who ran on the sword. That's called suicide. They are the ones who witnessed to their faith despite persecution and even death. And so I encourage us all, when you're criticized, when people give these backhanded statements against the Catholic Church or against Christianity, rejoice and be glad. Because the church most persecuted by the spirit of the world 